Kia ora and welcome to Muffin Talk. Muffin Talk is a weekly radio program to which I invite guests to talk about their work and their passion for issues on community programs, social justice, Bible studies, the Catholic Church, or interfaith relations. My interviews are done in the studio of Planet FM or via Zoom. My name is Beate Mattis, and I'm pleased to introduce Professor Paul Morris to you. Warm welcome to you, Paul. Thank you, Beate. Paul Morris is Emeritus Professor of Religious Studies, Victoria University of Wellington, and holds the UNESCO Chair in Interreligious Understanding and Relations in New Zealand and the Pacific. Paul, one of the research projects your group is currently working on is the Religious Literacy and Competency in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Can you tell us more about this project? I, I can. Um, religious literacy is something of recent invention, a recent thought, dating, at least popularized by a 2008 book by Stephen Prother at Boston University. The title of this book is What Every American uh, Should Know But Doesn't. His survey highlighted the absence of knowledge, accurate and good knowledge about uh, religions, in spite of an increasing religious diversity. Now, all countries are religiously diverse. New Zealand is no exception. And every country has its own distinctive uh, model of uh, religious diversity. And in that sense, New Zealand is, is comparatively, it's the 15th most out of 200 and plus uh, diverse countries. So it's a very diverse country. But with Tangata Whenua, with its indigenous uh, history and its colonial history and its history of recent migrations, um, it has a, a very particular and uh, unique pattern of religious diversity. Now, the, the important thing about religious diversity and the principle which we start from is that there's an awful lot of, as Prothero discovered, Professor Dan Moore at Harvard discovered, there, there are, there's, there's a lot of uh, illiteracy, religious illiteracy around. And what, why does it matter? Um, well, it matters because it's the illiteracy and bad information that fuels uh, prejudice, fuels discrimination, and challenges and threatens uh, uh, peaceful coexistence, peaceful living, uh, le vivre ensemble, this living together. Can you just uh, describe a little bit what illiteracy means? Because, of <laughs> course, you have literacy as uh, being able to read, and illiteracy, does it mean no knowledge at all or just uh, stumbling over the words? No, I mean, we're, we're, we're all aware of religious diversity. I, I suppose the, the, to, to go back just a tiny bit, um, I, the religious literacy, is uh, it's argued by Prothero, is like numeracy and literacy and digital literacy, a kind of essential capacity for 21st century citizenship. And so in that sense, it, it's, it's meant to be essential knowledge. Illiteracy uh, derives from the fact that people know about different religions, but we live, and particularly our, our residents in New Zealand, in a place uh, filled with a kind of uh, secular privilege. And so people are second and third generation non-religiously affiliated, institutionally affiliated. And so many people have never been to a church or a synagogue or a gurdwara or a temple. And the majority of New Zealanders are deinstitutionalized or secularized in this way. So the knowledge they do get comes from misbehaving priests, financial improprieties, et cetera, et cetera. And they often have part of the secular privilege is a kind of dismissing of religion and not taking it very seriously and seeing it as a, a kind of uh, the religions of the ships of fools. You know, they're, they're places where weak and silly people go and because they don't know any better. So the kind of illiteracy that seems significant is not knowing accurately about religion is more likely to hinder you operating in a world where 40% of the population claim some religious affiliation, and perhaps 15% are very actively religious. So we're talking about sizable numbers that I, th I feel are all too easily dismissed in that way. The issue of what constitutes religious literacy, I suppose it, 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 it has a number of dimensions. Its main uh, principle is the ability, the capability, 
to think about religion and discuss it in a meaningful, accurate and intelligent way, also in a critical way. By critical, I mean you need to be able to distinguish queer, clearly between descriptive and analytical statements about religion from confessional and uh, internal statements of faith. You need to understand uh, some religious practices. You need to understand something of how a religion came to your land, uh, something of its background and history, and something of its internal diversity, and something of the ways in which it's uh, interpenetrated with culture, and often cultures in the plural. Further than that, religious literacy entails some awareness of the role that religion plays within a society. So why some people hold very different moral positions? What, are people organized uh, politically? And uh, the impact of religion upon our society. And so in that sense, the ability to discuss it meaningfully and engage with religious communities at a kind of theoretical level is part of religious literacy. And to understand how it intersects with our culture, with our legal traditions, with our musical traditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you think from what you've done so far that people who are religiously affiliated, that they are higher um, literate even in other religions? Um, in our initial um, pilot studies, it's, it's been a very interesting. We, we want to take the religious literacy a little bit further as you, uh, when you introduced it, it's religious literacy and competency. We want yeah. also the knowledge to be applied. There is quite good evidence to support the notion that religious literacy fosters and promotes uh, social inclusion and, and, and uh, uh, social cohesion. And uh, in that sense, we want you not just to know about religion, but know how to apply this knowledge with people of different faiths. And so not to offend them, uh, not to upset them, to be aware of uh, their, their practices and their beliefs, and to accommodate them in a very positive way, yeah. um, within your life and within the life of the institutions uh, in which you're part. It's a very interesting issue. I, we haven't gone as far as some of the American studies, but one of the things that came out of the application of Prothero's study was a, a kind of index of different religious traditions and how religiously literate they were. And it is the case that some particular traditions are more aware of other traditions and uh, often better at, uh, at religious literacy, have higher levels of religious literacy. You, you have a survey, don't you? We and do. ask people, can you give a question, uh, something, an example of how are you approaching to get this information from the people? Yes, yes. Um, the, um, the, 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 we have a, a two-part survey. Um, I, I was going to say before that, to answer your last yeah, question, because yeah. I, I think it's a, a really important one. The, the first notion that um, the uh, existing reports and, and research show that not only are there high levels of illiteracy, not only do they have negative consequences, but people can learn about religion. <laughs> so the important thing is <laughs> that, that people do change, they can become literate, and they can become religiously and culturally competent. And so uh, otherwise it sounds terribly negative. <laughs> In answer to your different question, minority religious traditions are often much more aware of religious difference for political reasons, but also um, just because of their position, and often have a, a broader knowledge of different religions. Uh, majority faiths and larger parts of majority faiths uh, often see their own position as a kind of default one and uh, often don't have uh, uh, particular expertise. What is clear and uh, won't be appreciated by everyone, but this is American information, we haven't got this in New Zealand yet, um, is that liberal, liberal Jews, liberal Christians, uh, liberal Muslims, um, those who operate in, in, a, in a kind of broader pluralistic society have higher levels of literacy. 
and uh, more traditionally minded people uh, often know a great deal about faith, but what, some of what they know is prejudicial and negative <laughs> <laughs> and uh, framed more theologically than analytically and descriptively. But there are exceptions to that. And because uh, we're now talking about uh, more than a decade of thinking along these lines, uh, religious literacy is increasing. And uh, it's also being given uh, political priorities and higher, uh, a kind of higher profile. You asked how we're going to, to study it. Well, we, we've, as you said, we've developed a, a survey. And uh, the survey is divided into two sets of 20 questions. And the first questions are about religious literacy. And, uh, they want you to know something of the history. They want to know uh, how many Jews are in New Zealand, how many Muslims are in New Zealand. Um, are there Christian political parties in New Zealand? Do we have uh, our sessions of parliament beginning with a parliamentary prayer? Is it inclusive or exclusive? Are there different uh, issues um, uh, for particular religious groups in relation to New Zealand law? Um, ranging from the Coroner's Act to different appreciations of uh, uh, food availability or uh, meat preparation, et cetera, et cetera. And so you, the, the first uh, section wants to look at what you need to know about religion and particularly focused on Aotearoa New Zealand. So who's here and what difference does it make? The second half focuses on the practicalities of interreligious encounter, which are if you invite some Muslims for dinner, the question of uh, whether it should be Pinot Gris or Pinot Noir may not be the principal <laughs> question. Pork chops should probably be off the menu. But there, there are issues of uh, proximity, physical distancing, clothing, food, holidays, arranging meetings and times and gatherings at times of uh, other people's uh, holy times and sacred times. The survey is to test our knowledge and awareness of this. Our initial work has shown that people have uh, a kind of differential knowledge in the sense that um, they understand some traditions and have little exposure to others. And it's to do partly with uh, media uh, highlighting and, and particular experiences with, uh, with religious communities. And certain in the cities in New Zealand, the chances of uh, engagement with those of other uh, religious traditions is just much higher. And so one thing we notice is that those who live in smaller towns in, in rural New Zealand have had less exposure. And unless they've gone out of their way to, to learn about these things or engage, religious competency experience uh, um, is lower. But also, if you have a small village, it's, uh, the, the danger of creating ghettos is not so big. Because uh, you depend on each other and you're more likely to be friends without asking for the religion. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And uh, some of the earlier work I did on the religious statement, of the religious diversity statement, we went to small towns and had meetings in town halls. And as you rightly say, in some small towns, there may only be a very small number of Muslim uh, families or Hindu families or uh, of, of different religions, and uh, everyone knew about it. <laughs> and so th that is true. But generally speaking, New Zealand is, is fortunate in, the, in that way. I mean, that we, we list more than 150 different religious groups suggests our uh, religious freedom and our openness to different religions is, is high and working. We don't tend to have very large concentrations of communities. And uh, migrant religious communities uh, have tended to be proportionately small, which means, it means that we, we haven't had ghettos in the sense of uh, uh, intensive geographical areas defined by particular traditions. They are also from the same uh, cultural background. There, there, well, a number of cultural backgrounds that overlap, but yes. Yeah. And so there, there, there is a, a, a sense in which there are concentrations, but we don't have the kind of closed areas and uh, areas where other languages predominate uh, that, that has happened in, uh, in uh, different places in Europe. I also believe when, when you say about um, the 150 different 
religions, faiths, yes. faith groups. Uh, okay. Census <laughs> categories, census <laughs> religious categories, yeah. Because then you have um, one religious group like the Buddhists and you or the Christians, or you have so many subgroups yes. that it will be very difficult to first create a survey about what do you know about the Buddhists or the Christians. And uh, then the other question is, do you have people who really understand all these different groups within the religion to say, yes, that is correct, or yeah, it's almost correct? Yes, I, 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 I think the, the important thing is, uh, um, I started off by saying internal diversity is a, a basic component of religious literacy. The other thing is that religions change over time. And uh, thirdly, that they change in different contexts, in different ways, different uh, embedded in different societies and with different cultural influences. So in that sense, th there's something familiar already about the communities we, that we encounter in uh, our suburbs, in our cities, in our towns. Um, and that diversity, which is uh, a fact, because one doesn't need to master it all, but one needs to be aware of the difference. The question is not to um, know everything about, uh, you know, more than 100 different Buddhist groups or Christian denominations and, and, and Christian sectarian groups, but actually to know what questions to ask and to be broadly aware, firstly, that they're not all going to be the same. Not all Buddhists are going to be the same. Not all Jews are going to be the same. Um, but there is a framework of knowledge, and even if it's not definitive, it, that there are useful places to start. And uh, starting with why Buddhists think of themselves as Buddhists is a, is a really good place to start, or why do the Quakers, Pentecostal Christians, and um, High Anglicans and Catholics all think they're Christians when they're from the outside. I'm talking about myself. Their services seem so radically different. So part of this religious literacy and competency is asking the right questions. Uh, how many people are going to participate? So we have, I don't know, five million people in New Zealand. Yes. The number we, we're looking for is 500 plus. But the results will be weighted um, and the survey will be weighted. So if we don't get any Uh, uh, or sufficient numbers of particular groups, we'll, we'll go out and find them. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the idea of a weighted survey is to look at the results in terms of the uh, proportion of people within uh, society. So we, we, we want most of our responses to be from um, people who don't have re religious affiliations, And we want there to be more Christian responses than Jewish or Sikh responses, for argument's sake. And it would be good to have a, a lot of responses from people who are misinformed. That's going to happen inevitably, I, I suspect. <laughs> but, um, but yes, but we, we're not looking for them in particular, but I'm, I'm sure that we'll, we'll find them. And, and the, the questions are designed to highlight some of these misunderstandings. Yeah. Um, it's not a quiz with prizes for how good you are. It's a, <laughs> a baseline uh, figure that we want to know, basically to try and discern where educational energies and uh, where courses would be best directed. We also uh, have factored in a number of variables. We mentioned before uh, urban and rural. We also have gender. We have uh, uh, age bands, the census age bands, because a age may make a great difference. Uh, it, it certainly does in the British studies. And uh, we also have uh, people's religious traditions, which uh, harkens back to one of your questions. And we've got one question in there about the intensity of whether they see themselves not only a Christian, but that it plays a major part in their lives or a moderate part, more moderate part in their lives. We also uh, are looking for profession. Often in the people professions or those uh, the service professions, there are higher demands to for different forms of religious and cultural competency. Yes. We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think there will be some people who who just say, "No, I'm refusing to participate in any stuff like this," and these would be the persons who might be really important for the survey? But will you <laughs> record that you had so and so many people declining? Yes. For so and so many, for these and these reasons, yes. um, because it could be very uh, neutral, but it could be exactly the opposite that they know, they think that they know it and don't want to participate. 
there's that category. The other protections we have are you you can only do it once, so you can't get better at it. <laughs> will you get the results, even though you don't get a prize, but will you get the results so that you know yourself how literate you are? No, no. It's, the, the detail, it's not meant to... Uh, I'm going to uh, produce a little version of it, a much shorter version of it, um, which we've tested with students, which is just for fun, yeah. which is does give you a result <laughs> and is uh, 10 minutes rather than 20. And uh, it is a, a starting off for discussing about what we got right and wrong. But the the, the larger survey, the interest isn't so much in knowing the, the, uh, the results will be anonymized. Um, what we're looking for are the, are the broad patterns. When the survey is finished and you have the results, yeah. what is then the next step? Are you going to go to the government and say we need support for uh, more religious literacy because this could improve social cohesion? Or how are you going to go about it? Our, our aim will be to produce a report and uh, we will uh, give copies of it to Uh, the MSD to the Minister of Education to the Human Rights Commission and uh, do a press release so there, there's some uh, take up of the results we hope but it'll be up to it's up to the RDC to keep promoting religious education in schools um, to promote religious education in and religious competency and literacy in the workplace and through courses, through professional development. And I think that there are some wonderful examples where you, where the companies can, can have an advantage by knowing what the rules are, because if they know that, uh, for example, the Christians have a public holiday on that Sunday, they can employ a Jew or a Muslim or Hindu <laughs> And for that day, and uh, then when their holy day is, you can have a Christian. I think that it um, in a country where you have many religions, you will always have some religious feast days. But if you have a diverse uh, working group or a diverse team, you will also always have somebody who can do the what is yeah. asked. I, I think the um, certainly there there have been issues in the past uh, about employers not being terribly responsive to non-secular Christian calendars um, and uh, the the advice that has been given and um, the uh, involvement of uh, people like me and others I mean has been a greater flexibility and it has to be done sensitively there are privacy issues you you can't force people to declare themselves but with just a little bit of goodwill and a little bit of flexibility, uh, issues such as, uh, as you say, as, as calendrical issues, different holy days, different holidays, uh, can be uh, reasonably easily accommodated. So mostly it's, it's religious illiteracy and, and <laughs> incompetency, the results is. And some of the, the issues... Um, Uh, when you read about them that have ended up in employment tribunals or queries or complaints to the human rights are shocking in how little knowledge they there there would be to put the, you know to to avoid these issues mm. um there are particular issues in new zealand over alcohol and the way in which uh, there are traditions here of friday afternoons of uh, of knocking off early for beer and sausages which for people with different religious norms, different diets, I mean, are, are excluded, but not by design. I think that this is changing in society anyways, because there are more and more vegetarians and vegans and yes. uh, more and more people who say they don't want to drink and drive. So I think that these yeah, yep. traditions might change regardless. Oh, of religion. I think you're absolutely right. I think they are changing <laughs> and they're changing positively. They still arise. <laughs> Since you've started with this research, um, have you had any comments or people saying, look, I had this wonderful example where I, where I did exactly the right thing with, a religious, with another religious group? Or I had a horrible uh, experience because I did the wrong thing. Do you, do you have any of these uh, sharing comments? On yes, uh, they're, <laughs> they're not all very nice. Um, but yes, no, we, 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 they, we had a, a, a case of a, a wholesaler in Auckland and, um, who had a number of women employees who were Muslim, who didn't want to have a drink. And uh, the employer had gone home to his wife. So it was very, very strange. Uh, we, these new women we had that we've just taken on, and um, they don't drink beer. 
and his wife had said to him this was reported back to us but the the wife had uh, reported that uh, but some some women uh, drink wine they don't drink beer and this was apparently news to this particular employer <laughs> following friday he turned up with his sausages they didn't want to eat but also um with uh, a cast a cask of white wine, which they didn't want to drink either. I, I think what you said is really important that just as we as a country have dealt with cultural competency with in relation to Māori Ritenga and the particular traditions and customs of Tangata Whenua, uh, th- there is a growing awareness. There are ways of including people rather than just axiomatically excluding them. A lot of people think the rules are hard and fast, and this is more problematic. Um, we had uh, one person who reported, well, yes, I, I um, we had a picnic, but we had no wine because we invited several Muslim families. And the Muslim family said, are you not having a drink? We don't mind. <laughs> so um, what, what, this isn't a rule book or, or a, a guidebook with prescri- that is prescriptive. It, it, it's, a, it's about being aware and being flexible in relation to, to others. But yes, mostly people have had positive experiences or else they don't until we've been talking to them say they've mentioned it. And so they say, well, I I was very offended when so-and-so said X about my faith, which is a generalization, not true, but I didn't say anything at the time. And I I think an, an awful lot of this is just, you know, is taken on the chin, particularly by minorities who do feel excluded, sometimes uh, feel uh, offended and sometimes very strongly offended, um, but don't feel they have the right to uh, uh, to raise it as an issue. And often it's not, uh, they're not put in that position because of willful nastiness or prejudice alone, but, but by illiteracy and incompetency. You do get one or two cases, as uh, we've been looking at this, of, of people who are mean. Of, of people who seem to have been aware and uh, one person I spoke to, I mean, subscribed to a, this is New Zealand, this is how we do it. If you don't like it, leave. What are the next steps now? The next steps are we uh, have permission now, um, that we have ethics permission, uh, is to launch the survey. We're going to have a, a core group of participants and then extend it. And we'll, we'll certainly put a link uh, on, the, uh, um, on the RDC website and uh, draw on other religious and secular communities. We have uh, the results to come in and to organise and read them and work out which are significant variables and which aren't. It may turn out that uh, it matters less uh, where you live than the faith that you adhere to or, or not whether you have one or not. It may turn out that education makes an enormous difference, positively or negatively. It may be that gender is significant. I mean, we won't know until we look at it. <laughs> then the aim will be to produce a, a kind of uh, summary of uh, flash results um, for attention and uh, publicity leading on to a, a fuller report. Uh, it might also be one of the things we've kept as a possibility uh, is some follow-up studies, which is to look at particular communities or particular issues that are problematic. So if we discovered that nobody had heard of religion X, (laughs) um, it it might be interesting to know. Uh, In the uh, earlier, in the survey we did about religious education and religious uh, uh, studies, um, it was very clear that uh, uh, South Asian faiths Uh, Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, a a sizable minority of New Zealanders don't have very distinct views about these, don't uh, value them as part of a a curriculum or syllabus, So, which was the question. But but, uh, society has changed. Now we have more people from Southeast Asia here, and so the results might be uh, a lot more positive, and maybe they don't know so much about Christianity. Who knows? Yes, (laughs) and I'm sure that's changing too. So, yes, so, but but it would, it's, uh, there there may be follow-ups to to think through some of uh, these particular issues, yeah. How many people are involved in your group? Myself and three students, we will bring on board another one or two people to uh, formulate the results and uh, help with the preparation of the final report. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. No, and no, I'm looking you. forward to seeing some results. <laughs> That's the aim. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.